This is The Atomic Bombshell, The Minx Devlin Chronicles, a 10-part exploration of the astonishing life and tumultuous times of film noir goddess and 50s exploitation queen, Clara Minx Devlin. The woman who incinerates the screen with her evil desires. Trouble never came in a more seductive package. You know, it's funny. You're a tramp, a slaughter, a cheap, worthless strumpet, and yet I'm still madly in love with you. A Renoir portrait, as written by Balzac, but with the droll irony of Voltaire. She is, in my considered opinion, the most dangerous woman alive. I'm your host, Arlie Proctor, with my partners, Hazel Matthews, Skylar DeWolf, and the subject of our series herself, Ms. Clara Devlin. In our last episode, Minx Devlin in Love, Part 1, she shared her history-altering romantic adventures with John F. Kennedy and Elvis Presley. This week, Minx Devlin in Love, Part 2. Here she reveals... My one great transcendent love. The moment I experienced my greatest happiness as a person and as an artist. The moment I stared up at the stars and touched the face of God. And it all begins with a letter. Dear Miss Minx Devlin. The letter has come from Paris, France. It's addressed to Minx Devlin, immortal goddess of world cinema, care of Zuzman Pictures. Herbie dropped it in my home mailbox after steaming it open and reading it, the bastard. My name is François Truffaut. I, like Keats, I'm certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of imagination. Since that first moment I saw your face on the screen in that ridiculous masterpiece, Devil Girl of Cannibal Island, you have inflamed my imagination. As I read this, I'm squatting in a seedy one-bedroom apartment on Coanga Boulevard, pending my divorce from Herbie Z. I'm a 33-year-old has-been whose last film was an amateurish disaster. I have to find work fast. At this very moment, I'm sitting in my office at Les Films du Carros. A dozen candles illuminate the walls, walls covered with purloined film posters. There's the huge, moon-like, peachamber face of Minx Devlin looming over the lost, lonely figure of Tom Neal and Thrill Queen. There's the weeping angel of vengeance Minx Devlin, guns blazing, the firecracker of love, on the poster for Hell is a Female, for the genius cinematic primitive Sam Fuller. And my most valued possession, the innocent yet ironic, dewy yet deadly Minx Devlin of Edgar G. Ulmer's micro-budget masterwork, Mark of the Spider Gal. After getting the brush off from every legitimate agent in town, I grabbed the very last knot on the show business rope, the Gidney Biggs Agency. Gidney is a 66-year-old ex-vaudeville plate spinner. <laughs> He handles contortionists, jugglers, human cannonballs, fire eaters, and the odd geek or two. Your films are now and have always been a purgative, cleansing my soul of the filth and corruption of the poison commerce of bourgeois culture. That I might be so presumptuous as to approach this icon de l'amour, this colonel divinity, well, I might as well presume to take a presidence inside a dream. And yet here I am. You're my sin, my salvation, my soul. In my first week with Mr. Biggs, I'm rejected as a model in a commercial for the Glamour Glow Magic Turban, a fraudulent feminine hair care product. Also, I'm rejected as a housewife in a one-day commercial shoot, romancing the line, I can't believe there's no waxy buildup. <laughs> and as the semi-hysterical next-door neighbor on a sitcom pilot called which Witch is Which, about identical twin witches played by Martha Ray. The same producer who propositions me tells me I'm too old for the part. Neither the show nor I get picked up. In October of 1948, I formed the Cercle Cinéma with some fellow cineasts, opening our doors to the public. You and your films were our salvation, Miss Devlin. And I mean that literally. One week, we would starve to death with Sacha Guitry's Le Roman d'un Tricheur. The next week, we would have standing room only for Jive Crazy. 
So I still talk to Jack Kennedy twice a week, but he's got his hands full getting the country moving again, so to speak, as if America were a bowel movement. As for my relationship with Herbie, he's still doing everything possible to monkey wrench the divorce. He won't show me his books. He won't cough up a single dollar he owes me from the movies we made together, which are cleaning up at drive-ins around the country. Oh, he does offer me $1,500 to play the lead in his next picture, Sinner Rama a no-budget, nudie cutie in the Russ Meyer manner about an amorous mailman with x-ray vision and a buxom babe referred to in the script as Sexy Cindy, Queen of the Pose magazines. I would rather starve. I will be in Los Angeles soon to confer with Mr. Alfred Hitchcock about a book project. Would it be possible to meet you for lunch? I feel as if I've been staring at this face of love since the beginning of time. And yet, an eternity would not be long enough to solve its sweet mysteries. It is too much to ask that we might work together. I know you must be pledged for roles into the next decade. And yet, I'm reminded of Goethe's words. Pleasure and love are the opinions of great deeds. I will call you upon my arrival. Until then, I remain your most ardent admirer. François Truffaut Soulmate is one of those woo-woo, new-age banalities that infatuated couples hurl at each other to flatter themselves a month before the crockery starts flying. And yet, I believe we all have soulmates, and Monsieur Truffaut will turn out to be mine. We meet at The Smokehouse, a steak restaurant near Warner's. He takes my hand, looks in my eyes, and whispers... A Renoir portrait, as written by Balzac, but with the droll irony of Voltaire. A line from his review of Devil Girl. I smile and say, uh, Sorry, that film is a piece of merde. He chuckles as I struggle to recover the French I learned from Maggie, and then he quotes Vladimir Nabokov. There is nothing more exhilarating than Philstein vulgarity. We wander into a delicious garden of conversation that begins with lunch, meanders through every imaginable cultural thicket, dissolves into dinner, and ends up in his garret in the Chateau Marmont, where we become lovers. The man charms me utterly. After so many years of fending off wolves, con men, and pushy jerks, here is a smart, humble, unpretentious artist of the cinema. Of course, it helps that he is enthralled with my screen persona. He says, In my cinema, films are as personal as a fingerprint. Hitchcock is my god. Hawks and Renoirs are kings. And you, Miss Devlin, are my guardian angel, the star I trust to navigate my adventure. Always the original choice, the risk, the direct emotion. As I glory in this ridiculous shower of hosannas, <laughs> it dawns on me that I got a problem. Truffaut has mentioned something about working together. If only I weren't so darn busy, he says. How can I hint that I'm at liberty without letting him know how desperate my straits really are? So, you know what? I decide on the truth. Francois, I say... I'm one week away from a job as a cocktail waitress. He is stunned, outraged. He rails at the idiots, cretins, doltish mooncaps of world cinema who would squander an exquisite bijou like Minx Devlin. As I snuggle in his arms, he conjures the movie we'll make together. He calls it L'Ironie Drôle Inexprimable Romantique de in Chevetremont, which translates really loosely as it is to laugh. <laughs> I ask him what it's about. He tells me that it's about the sweet agony of romantic love. The heady whiff of perfume, the wicked knowing glance, the sudden taking and the rough surrender, the lust and wanting and exhilaration and nauseated soul sickness and sweet hope and mortal grief. It's about the desperate, 
impossible desire to find and capture what can only be seen for a moment, like a soap bubble or a moonbeam. Is it any wonder I adore this man? I mean, just like that, I'm on my way to Paris. My glorious Paris holiday is the happiest time of my life. In fact, it's the only time I've ever been completely happy. Truffaut invites me into his second family, his filmmaking family at Les Films du Carros. In 1961, Francois Truffaut is a figure of worldwide acclaim for his breakthrough first film, The 400 Blows. Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard are part of what's being called the new wave. After an innovative style of filmmaking that embraces improvisation, handheld camera shooting on the streets of Paris, sexual honesty, and a frank love of unpretentious America genre films, the kind often starring Minx Devlin. Francois treats me like a fellow artist, and I come alive. He encourages me in the truest sense of that word, giving me courage to find every aspect, phase, mood, color, and contradiction in my character, Danielle, especially the dark ones. Truffaut isn't looking for an actor, he's looking for a partner to, well, in his words, Weave some dream cloth from the baseless fabric of vision. It is as close to pure artistic creation as I will ever come. The intimacy of our love life feeds the fire we're creating on film. Our relationship evolves from a wild, boisterous passion into a joyous bond of affection and devotion. He opens me up, invites me to take the dare. Our film, alas, is never completed. It was shown only once in rough cut form. Nothing of it exists except for some of the music. Oh, that is such a loss. What a tragedy. In more ways than one. I set out to find the man who destroyed my grandmother's dream and with it her happiness. And I found him, but Minx did not want to meet him. I was afraid that if I were to meet him, I'd either kill him or he'd kill me. Gaston Enfleur Fudando is a squat 82-year-old, unlanced boil of a man who forced me to fly to French Guiana to interview him. It's hard to believe this snarling misanthrope was one of the first producers to take a chance on the new wave filmmakers of France. The Truffaut-Devlin collaboration was to be his second film. The first was Jean-Luc Godard's A Useless Romance. Fudando currently works at the Camp de la Transportation at saint laurent du maroni as a tour guide, and this is where French convicts, including Alfred Dreyfus and Henri Papillon Charrière, arrived before they were assigned to one of French Guiana's notorious Devil's Island penal colonies. We spoke in his very leaky, weather-beaten 1949 Spartanet trailer coach, and here are his memories of making this movie and his memories of Minx Devlin. I was, of course, dead set against Truffaut's hiring of Miss Devlin. I assumed she was a cheap baggage, another of his mindless infatuations with all things America. He engaged her and coaxed me to come to the shoot. I was used to women falling at my feet, but oh, she treated me like dirt. I was shocked. No one treated me like that, especially a mere movie actor. I stalked off and showed up the next day, and then the next, becoming a regular visitor to the set. Every man wants what he can't have, I guess. And the more... She spurned me the more I wanted her. It was as if Miss Devlin were the sun, and the paralytic vigor of her allure exerted a gravitational pull that kept me circling her, never able to capture her, and yet unable to break free. Truffaut loved to torture me. I had never been in the thrall of such a powerful emotion, and I, I couldn't even work up the nerve to speak to the girl, me, the man who controlled hundreds of millions of francs, 
who stared down industrialists and terrified bankers drenched in cold sweat at the thought of talking to a woman. And yet, my heart quaked when she walked by and snubbed me. Filming was nearly complete. I had to make a move or I was going to self-emulate. I was consumed with the idea that all future happiness depended on capturing this butterfly. I finally got her alone. It was a Sunday, early spring. I rented out a pleasure cruise boat to travel the Seine at night. I hired my friend Stefan Grappelli to put together a new version of his hot club and serenade Miss Devlin with Gershwin medleys. The finest food, vintage champagne. I was ready. Miss Devlin arrived wearing one of those little black dresses designed by Coco Chanel. It was an astonishing creation. Demure, yet more brazenly erotic than nakedness. It revealed her regal neck, her elegant arms, and her astonishing legs shod in matching black high-heeled pumps. Emboldened by the bubbly, I suggested we repair to the boudoir. Oh, this was tricky. I had perjured myself to win her company. Once the lie was revealed, oh, what then? Now, does this ring true to you? Well, we're all entitled to our version of the story. Fuddles had lured me on this boat with an irresistible lure. He told me he had the greatest script ever written, the dream role for a woman, a free adaptation of Madame Bovary set in modern-day France, told from Emma Bovary's point of view, finished by Albert Camus. Right before he died in that tragic car crash, the great Renoir himself had agreed to direct. It was a fantasy masterpiece that existed only in my imagination. He told me the script was below decks. I figured he might try to jump me, but I thought the risk was worth it. I mean, Renoir directing Madame Bovary from a script by Camus? She walked down the stairs before me. I was more than slightly pifflicated and twittering like an aspen leaf when I inhaled an intoxicating draught of her perfumed coiffe, vol de nuit. Oh, I can smell it even now. I was a goner. I staggered to the bedroom, fell to my knees, and revealed my fraud. There was no script, of course. My entire goal was to seduce her, to conquer her. Instead, I was prostrate before her. I told her I was intoxicated with her. I needed her, and I wanted her. I fumbled in my pocket and produced a five-carat heart-shaped diamond ring, purloined from my wife's bureau. I told her this was my first bestowal, that if she became my lover, she'd never lack for a thing. I'd do whatever it took to capture and keep her heart. Another lovelorn wrench raining gemstones upon me in the grip of some romantic rhapsody where I am goddess, redeemer, and he is supplicant seeker. No thanks, Fuddles. Find yourself another goddess. Fuddles. How I hated that nickname. That baboon Trofaux first called me that. When Miss Devlin snubbed me and spat out that taunt well, something just slapped. I lunged at her, grabbed her wrist, and threw her down on the bed. A terrible rage exploded in my chest and roared in my head. A massive charge of mortification lit by the flame of drunkenness. Who did she think she was, relegating me to the slag heap of human dross? I was going to teach this troll a lesson. Then came the ultimate insult, a savage need to my groin. The emasculation was complete. And yet, the drama was just beginning, no? I learned how to handle situations like this. When I was part of the Zuzman Road Show in the late 30s, I was roughed up a couple of times, but never by the same guy twice. Yeah, I crunched his dingbats. <laughs> Had I known how he'd take this insult, well, I would have done it again, but I'd probably have dragged him to bed and tucked him in rather than leaving him on the floor twisting in pain. He seemed like the angry type. I didn't realize he was a self-destructive cauldron of rage. My mistake, and I'd soon pay for it. We're taking a very brief break in order to muster every ounce of persuasive firepower we've got to prevail upon you to go to richlyspun.com. That's richlyspun.com. 
and donate just a small amount of money, a pittance, just what you spend during one splurge at Starbucks to support this podcast. You know you want to, and Lord knows we want you to. So who's stopping you? No one. Do it now, even as we return to The Atomic Bombshell. So now we come to the screening of the rough cut, and Clara, I've read every word of your journals, and my favorite passage, uh, well, actually, what, what do you think it is? It's either the Suffolk rendezvous on my 21st birthday, or the screening of It Is to Laugh with Jean Renoir. And it is the second. Um, would you please read it? I titled this entry, Queen of the Dream Pavilion. I wasn't born into this world. I was launched. An errant generation of creative wanting, forever incomplete. A verb in search of a noun, a cosmic ham sandwich looking for a cup of coffee. At every step of the journey, I've asked, if this life of mine is the answer, what's the question? How can I get where I'm going if I don't know what I'm supposed to know when I get there? Well, tonight I get there, and how. Now I know what I didn't know I wanted. Now I know what it's like to be weightless, transparent, vivid, drunk with ecstasy. A question mark stretched to an exclamation point. At exactly 8.44 this evening... Our merry band of anarchists gathers to view the first rough cut of our little cinematic charade. Oh, uh, and Fuddles is there, of course, since he paid for it. He stares at me. I ignore him. I sit at Monsieur Truffaut's left hand. At his right, his mentor, Jean Renoir, perhaps the greatest filmmaker ever, certainly the most affable genius I've encountered. Truffaut introduces me to Renoir by saying, She's more than an actress. She's my muse. The lights go down. Truffaut's small hand is a clammy, cold glove when it squeezes mine for good luck. For two hours and 47 minutes, I'm living inside the dream we've all created together. Yes, it's 40 minutes too long, but it's a pip. Like a dream, it's both maddening and mesmerizing. It's, it's not a comment on human behavior or, or an idealized version. It's human beings as they are, crazy, contradictory, willful, and opaque. It never explains itself. It just breaks your heart. As the lights come up, tears are streaming down my face. I can't tell if they're from laughing or weeping, and I don't care. I am bereft that it's taken me my whole life to achieve a single moment of honest emotion on the screen, and I am filled with joy that I seized this moment so my lover could capture those emotions on film, where they will live forever. After the screening, the great Renoir embraces his spiritual son and addresses our group, and he says, It takes a great lover of life a true romantic to report the savage, unsentimental truth about love. My friend and colleague is a creative wonder, compelled to report the heart's deepest secrets with an honest, unflinching compassion. Now he turns to me. And while this marvelous film will confirm his abilities, it will reveal yours, Miss Devlin, a magnificent artist at the height of her powers. Your work has the heat and fervor of a first love's first kiss, heedless of risk, all prudence thrown to the wind, nothing held back. You invent with the unfettered joy of a child. In this great, amazing pavilion of dreams we call cinema, you are the new Erato, sweet muse of poetic love. Well, we all repair to a local cafe to bask in the afterglow of the screening. I don't remember the meal. I just remember wearing the accolades of Jean Renoir. Jean rules of the game, Renoir. Jean grand delusion, Renoir, like a mink coat, making a diamond necklace out of the stars and drinking the moon like a 
bottle of wine. As the sweet memory of that film plays and replays in my mind, it strikes me it's the first time in my life that I've been able to create without fear. For the first time, I really feel like I know what I'm doing and that what I'm doing is actually worth doing. Hmm. I toss my head back and hoot with laughter. I am made at long last. I am finally free to create fearlessly, carelessly with abandon. Now, I will hurl myself into the maelstrom of world cinema, redefining the possibilities and ambitions of film. I will become the kitchen sink goddess Truffaut thinks I am, desired and elusive. He and I will create one of the epic, timeless, immortal collaborations in film. Sternberg, Dietrich, Frank Capra, Gene Arthur, John Ford, Maureen O'Hara, Fellini, Julieta Messina, Francois Truffaut, Minx, Devlin. I will reign. I will scandalize the prudes and delight the hedonists. A salon in Paris, an apartment in Manhattan, perhaps a, I don't know, a chateau in the countryside where I'll spend lazy, indolent summers with Francois co-writing our next picture. I will sit in picturesque left-bank cafes, sipping espresso, smoking gitan. I'm hooked dismissing journalists and flirting with my many admirers. Sullen, savage writers, wild-eyed, paint-splattered, free-spirited artists, crazed, absinthe-sipping poets, funny, hip, night owl, jazz legends, incredibly handsome, hugely rich, insanely possessive film stars. Maybe, I don't know, even a politician or two. <laughs> Not the president, no, but prominent enough to bring down the government if we're discovered. I will live life for its own sake. Yes, I will thaw the frozen echo of the silent voice of God. I will use myself up, flame the candle into a puddle of wax. And when I'm in my 90s, I'll be a cranky old crone dressed in a billowy purple caftan with a huge paisley scarf and sunglasses. I will sit center stage at celebrations of my films and tell the outrageous, unvarnished truth about my work, my lovers, and my life. And even I will be amazed at what I've done. And I will die in the arms of my great love, Francois, my friend, confidant, and creative co-conspirator, and he, he will weep, and one person will have cared that I ever lived. Ugh, oh, to be loved and love like that. I mean, if only just, you know, once in my life. I really, I want to give myself the way you gave yourself, and I want to be courageous like that. Oh, everyone should have one moment of perfect happiness like that. Unfortunately, well, do you have the clipping? Oh, I do. Okay, read it. This is from Perry Match. The headline is Film Lab Fire. Police Seek Terror Syndicate. A dynamite charge destroyed the Path Natan Film Lab in Franceur at 3.37 a.m. yesterday morning. Firefighters battled the blaze for three hours but the film processing facility was devastated. Three of the five buildings were leveled completely, including the massive storage vault where the film negatives are held. Including every scrap of footage from Truffaut's It Is To Love. How did you pull it off? I stole some dynamite from a building site. No guards at two in the morning. It was quite easy, truth to tell. But why? I well knew what kind of impact this film would have on our world cinema. I knew that all the bouquets would be hurled at Truffaut and Miss Devlin, and that once this film was released, she would ascend to a celestial realm far above my reach. I am not a criminal, though I was treated worse than a mongrel dog once my crime was discovered. I was, at the time, insane with jealousy and impotence. I knew in my bones that what was happening was a great crime against me. Truffaut, the toad, was using my money, my money, to seduce this woman to make this masterwork which would forever remove her from my grasp. 
and for my largesse they labelled me fathers. Rejected, humiliated, they thought they held all the cards. I showed them. How did you get caught? I think I could have gotten away with it had I wanted to. I was relieved when the night watchman came forward and identified my Citron as the one leaving the scene at 2 a.m. Why were you relieved? Because I wanted the world to know why I'd done it. After all, what was this alleged crime? No one was hurt. I waited until everyone had gone for the day. I am a patron of the arts. It is my perfect right to destroy what I brought into this world. Now and forevermore, it will only exist in the imaginations of those who were there that one night. Of those, only two are left. Miss Devlin and myself. She never became a mistress. But she never became an international film goddess either. She may think of me with great hatred. I'd be amazed if she didn't. But I doubt she thinks of me with derision. I would rather be hated than scorned. I was convicted of my crime and then sent here to what's cheerfully called the Devil's Armpit, the last French penal colony in French Guiana. I served 23 years and was released when the colony was abandoned. Since that time, I have spent my time giving tours of this hellhole and writing my memoirs. Tell Miss Devlin she will just have to wait to see how she is portrayed. Gone. All gone. I knew at once what had happened. We'd captured a dream. Now, it would remain just that. A dream. The night of the bombing, Francois meets me at his favorite brasserie on the corner of Rue Marbeuf and Rue Robert Etienne, a few yards from his office. We sit in silence, food untouched. Then we walk to the Cinématique Française, for the European world premiere of It's Only Money, a Frank Tashlin comedy starring Jerry Lewis. A Roadrunner cartoon comes on before the feature. I'd always been able to laugh at the coyote, but tonight I realize that I am the coyote, that poor, hopeless, defeated bastard. Every brightly wrapped gift box holds a bomb. Every innocent-looking door sends me over a cliff. Every star I use to set my course turns out to be the headlamp of an oncoming train. <sighs> Francois and I walk hand-in-hand hand to the Montmartre Cemetery. Nijinsky is buried here, along with Hector Berlioz. We stare at the gate as he speaks for the only time that evening. When I was 11 years old, I snuck into a performance of the Symphonie Fantastique. Hearing those sounds changed my life. Berlioz had stared at the infinite and invented a language to express that glory. What he did with music, I've always wanted to do with film. It's a crazy, impossible, hopeless task, and yet you and I, together. Then he turns and he looks at me with those melancholy blue eyes. He cups my head in his right hand and draws my face toward his for one last lingering soulful kiss. He pulls a cream-colored envelope from the inside breast pocket of his Macintosh, kisses it, hands it to me, and walks away, never turning back. This is something I never put in my scrapbook. I've carried it with me, since the day he gave it to me. My dearest darling Minx, the great genius Chaplin once said, all drama is entrances and exits. It is time for my exit. The tragedy we have suffered, the murder of our brilliant cinematic child is all too much, too much, too much to bear. I remember as a very young man wanting to create something immortal, astonishing, sublime, a poem or a painting, perhaps just a Proustian epigram that I could share with a lover and that she and I could hoard our secret treasure stored in an impenetrable vault of memory with two keys. I was thrilled by the daring of this, the magnificence of the squander. I considered myself a genius just for hatching this scheme. 
I never discovered the woman worthy of such extravagance until I met you. Only now I'm an older man and I can see my early wish for what it was, the morbid dream of a romantic juvenile. And it's now that God, the ironist, has chosen to grant my wish. Perhaps someday, soon, I hope, this wound will heal and fate will bring us together again. I have loved you from the first moment I saw you on the screen, and my adoration has been, if anything, enhanced by our partnership. I will cherish our moments together, hold them up to the light, wonder anew at their poignant splendor, and burnish them as they become sublime memories. All my love forever, Francois. On the morning I left France, I dropped this reply in the post. Dear Francois, we'll always have Paris with love and gratitude. Thanks. After you return to America and you bail JFK out of the Cuban Missile Crisis and whoop it up with Elvis Presley, Francois Truffaut makes what many consider to be his greatest film, Jules and Jim, a singular romantic drama starring Jean Moreau and Oscar Werner about a tragic love triangle. It's almost always included in lists of the 100 greatest movies of all time. I'm sure you've seen it. Many times. It is to laugh is in Jules and Jim. Jules and Jim is a howl of rage at the barbarity of fate inspired by what happened to our film. Ours was a romantic comedy about a love triangle, and Jules is the same, only as a tragedy. When I saw it, I couldn't stop crying. It's as if Francois had made the film just for me, to show how heartbroken he was about our film and our romance. All we had left was what he called our secret treasure, the memory of a work of art that no one would ever see that lived only in memory. I've never gotten over my love for Francois. He died so young, 52, a tragedy. I think of him every day and just for a moment, I feel the wonderful giddiness of the love I knew for a single moment, the love of a man the love of creating and a terrible love for this fallen world where people make plans and God laughs. My heart was broken and I became what Native Americans call a real human being. The Atomic Bombshell, The Mink Stevlin Chronicles, is produced in Hollywood, California by Tales Richly Spun. This episode is directed, produced, and edited by Matthew Solari and written by R. Lee Proctor. Co-producer Kevin Whitaker, artwork by Rowan Proctor. Special thanks to Caitlin Mulder, Stephen Smith, Nancy Linehan Charles, Francois Aubrey, and Piat Michael. Please visit richlyspun.com slash atomic bombshell to find books and movies that illuminate the epic French cinematic new wave of the early 1960s led by Francois Truffaut. And while you're perusing the website, why not order your very own copy of The Atomic Bombshell, Mink Stevlin's melodramatic memoir as told to her granddaughter Hazel Matthews. Read it, and then tell Minks and Hazel if they left the very best stuff out of the podcast. Join us next time for the final apocalyptic adventure, episode number 10, Sweet Atom Bomb Genius of Desire, where every question about Ming Stevlin's life will be answered and every mystery cleared.